Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this episode of Build on AWS series. Um, I'm Alex Casalboni and today's episode is focused on security for serverless applications. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go through some of the basics, some of the features, some of the integrations that uh, you can have in your service app in applications when it comes to security, some of the, the best practices. Um, so it will be, there will be a little presentation in the beginning and then I'll mostly do live coding. So we'll build something together and we'll apply some of these best practices. So uh, let me tell you what I do. I'm a technical evangelist here at AWS and uh, I used to be a web developer full time. I work in a startup. I also organize some serverless events around the world. Uh, so if you are curious about those, ask me anything. Uh, I'll be looking at the chat every now and then. So if you have specific questions, don't be afraid to ask. There are other friends and colleagues that can also take your questions. So uh, no question is a stupid question. Don't be shy. Ask us anything today. Um, so this is the. The agenda for today is very simple, but before that, I wanted to briefly tell you what we really mean by serverless computing, because maybe not everybody is familiar with the term. So the idea, and on screen you can see what our CTO Werner Vogels said a couple years ago when we announced most of the serverless platform. The idea is that as developers we want to write business logic. Everything we want to care, everyone we want to maintain is business logic. So the main core of your business uh, should be all you need to write. And uh, that means that maintaining servers, spinning up instances, uh, patching the operating system, especially when it comes to security, that's a lot of heavy lifting that as developers, we don't, you know, maybe that's not your main focus or, uh, you know, in general, if you can offload that, to the cloud provider, in this case, Amazon Web Services. Um, you know, that will give you speed and agility and you'll be able to move faster and to deliver uh, results faster as a team. Um, so the idea of serverless computing, uh, especially when it comes to the computing part of it, uh, AWS Lambda, our uh, function as a service offering, is that all you need to write is your functions, your serverless functions. And these functions come with different languages and different shapes with different events and triggers that can spin up your functions. Uh, so today we are not going too deep into these basics because we want to focus on security, on the security aspects. And if you're curious, you know, maybe ask in the chat, we can uh, provide some links, some videos, some other getting started resources specifically about uh, serverless. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, I will give you a little background on security concepts um, some of the best practices, some of the tools available, and then I'll show some uh, self-paced material that you can take with you and, uh, and, uh, and use it and consume it at your own pace. Uh, it's actually a workshop, and I'll take inspiration from this workshop and show you um, some of the modules, some of the steps uh, of this workshop in this live coding experience. Um, which is the third part of the agenda. So let's start uh, and let's go through some of these security background concepts. Uh, what are the best practices? What are the things that you may want to avoid uh, when building your serverless applications? And what are the tools and services that can help you uh, deal with some of the most common uh, uh, challenges? So first of all, uh, there are two important concepts to remember when it comes to uh, security, and that's the permission model of AWS Lambda. Uh, so when basically your functions, as soon as you create them, you know they have no permission attached. Maybe they have permissions to log something into CloudWatch logs, uh, but basically if they need to read from database or uh, uh, you know write into a queue or anything like that, they don't have permissions to do so. And even if you want these functions to be invoked via API Gateway, via HTTP, you know, you need some permissions there. So there are two very important concepts. The first one is uh, the execution policies. And this basically means what your functions can do, right? So if you want a function A to read from a DynamoDB table, you need to specify that permission. Otherwise, you will get access denied, right? You don't want any function reading any database or any function right into any queue or, or, or a pub sub topic, things like that. 
So this is very important. And as developers, you exactly know what your function is doing, and you, you know it doesn't take too too much effort to write down uh, these permissions. And I'll show you uh, how you can do that, uh, even using the UI, the web console of uh, AWS. The second important concept is function policies. Um, this is slightly different concept because it's about who can invoke your functions, what other services can invoke your function. So we talk a lot about events or triggers in service computing. And basically imagine that every time that something happens, like there is a new file, or like a new image on Amazon S3, or there is a new record in your DynamoDB table, you know, if something happens in the system, you want to be able to invoke your functions. And here the concept is very similar. Unless you give explicit permission to S3 or to API Gateway or to DynamoDB to invoke your functions, those functions will not be able to be invoked. So function policies is you know, the complement of execution policies, so, you know, the, the other side of things. Uh, and we'll see how to do that. For example, if you want to build a RESTful API and you want to uh, API Gateway invoking your Lambda functions, so you can invoke your functions via HTTPS. Um, you, you know, if you're doing it in the console, when you map a RESTful endpoint to a Lambda function, you will get a confirmation message saying, hey, do you want me to create the uh, function policy for you so that API Gateway can invoke Lambda? And so in the console, it's a bit easy. Uh, if you want to do it uh, using CloudFormation, it's very similar. Uh, but you know, today we'll be using mostly the console. So let me start with some of the worst thing you can do as far as security. And this is about um, you know, the concept that we just saw, the execution policies. So something that a lot of developers tend to do is using placeholders like star. Okay? If you give permissions to your function to something like S3 uh, column star or DynamoDB star or SNS star, this means any, any API call related to S3 you know, this function can call it. Okay, you probably don't want that. I, in my experience, in 99% of the use cases, you don't want that, okay? Because S3 star means that your function can create bucket, delete buckets, change the configuration of a bucket. And really, in most use cases, that's not what you want. Your function probably wants to read from a bucket or write uh, objects into a bucket, but you know, creating buckets, deleting buckets from a Lambda function is slightly less common. And the same holds for DynamoDB. You don't want to create or delete tables. Usually, if that's what you need to do, uh, you can provide those permissions, but star means anything you want. So we, you don't want to do that. And you, we don't want to make puppies cry either. Um, so uh, in general, this is not only for Lambda functions for source computing, you want to apply the least privileged approach, uh, which means every function or every role or even every instance in your uh, you know, server full environment needs to have the least amount of privileges. So if you only need read permission, just grant read permissions, don't, don't grant any write permissions on your buckets or tables. And you can do that. You can be very granular. Uh, you can even provide, um, for example, with DynamDB, you can say this function can only read from this specific table, even only this specific field in that table, uh, like a column. It's no SQL, so there are no columns, but you can be very, very, very specific. Uh, so it's not only about which API calls, it's also about which resources and which very fine-grained resources these uh, your functions can invoke, read, write, whatever uh, uh, action. Uh, how do you do that? Well, if you're using the best practice of infrastructure as code and you are defining your applications as a JSON or a YAML template, well, it takes only a few lines of configuration. Okay? In this case, we are saying this function called my function can dynamically get item only in one specific table that I am creating in the same uh, cloud formation uh, template. So I can even reference it. I don't have to our code the ID of the resource either. So this way you can be very specific. It doesn't take you an hour if, if it's one um, uh, and if it's one resource, if it's one API call that you need and get item is, is pretty common. Uh, that's like three or four or five lines of YAML. So 
as a developer, you exactly know what you're doing, what your code is doing. The sooner you do this, the more time you will spare later on in your project. Because if you do DynamoDB star, you know, at some point, someone else in the organization will stop you and say, no, this function will not go uh, live because it has too broad permissions. And then you have to go back, look at your code, and really try to remember what the code is doing. You know, you just waste more time later on. So you better do it even in your development environment. Just start applying this as a best practice all the time. Another thing that a lot of developers tend to do is hard coding stuff in, the, in your code. It's much easier, you're getting started, you're prototyping, but then you kind of forget about you know, that URL, that API endpoint, or, uh, or that configuration, that parameter, even that database password that you just hard coded in your code. Uh, you, know, you shouldn't do that. This is bad for two things for, on two different levels. The first one is if you git push, and if you are versioning your code and you get push your code uh, with these are coded secrets, you know, secrets might leak. Even if, it, if it's a private repo, you know, maybe it will become a public repo in six months, you never know. And you don't want to have these leak, leaked secrets in your Git history. Uh, the second level is that hard coding secrets means that reusing and centralized, centralizing the usage of your secret gets much harder when the number of your functions grow. Imagine you have only three functions today, but maybe in six months you will have 20 functions and maybe they are sharing some of these secrets. So you don't want to go and find out where this, your, your parameters, your secrets, your tokens, your password are being used and by which functions. Uh, and go and, and find them and redeploy them when these secrets change. You want to have a nice centralized place to save them and to update them only once for everybody, once for all. So let's see what are the tools to kind of mitigate these two challenges as, as developers. It's not too hard, really. It's just about applying the best practices. So there are three different ways you can do this. Um, the first one is using environment variables. And this concept exists kind of in, in, in every computing platform. You can inject a variable, uh, a value, a key value um, mapping uh, in your environment at, at runtime. So if you have a dev environment, a staging environment, a uh, production environment, you know, you might have different variables for the APIs you're calling, for the buckets or the databases or, you know, what, whatever changes based on the environment. Uh, and actually, environment variables are a very good uh, fit for all those parameters, all those configurations that are environment dependent. So again, an API, a, uh, you know, even a, uh, the name of your database or you know, so something that might change based on the environment. It's not the best fit, for example, for um, shared configuration or for uh, secrets and tokens and password that might change. So I do not recommend using environment variables for secrets. Uh, there are two more tools, services actually called System Manager Parameter Store and AWS Secrets Manager. Uh, so these two are a better fit for centralizing your parameters. Imagine you have 20 functions that all need to read from the same table. Okay, this is not really common because you don't want to do that, but uh, maybe that's what you have. So you don't want to hard code it 20 times in your environment variables because then you would need to redeploy those 20 functions when the value changes, right? You don't want to redeploy 20 functions. You don't even want to know exactly where that, uh, that parameter is being used and by how many functions at some point when there are so many things happening. So a nice way to centralize the value of these parameters is using the parameter store. Uh, it supports hierarchies of parameters, so you can have like different stages, different, um, uh, even multiple parameters under the same uh, path, so that you can fetch five or 10 parameters uh, with one API call just by using a prefix. Um, you have very fine with permissions as well for who can write and create these parameters versus who can read and consume these parameters, right? So your functions will probably need only uh, read access to those parameters. Um, there is a third use case that is a very good fit for the AWS Secrets Manager, 
which is um, all those parameters that are not just static strings, but that might be um, something that changes over time, something that, for example, we want to rotate periodically. Think about database passwords, or think about uh, tokens of third-party services like your Twitter, Twitter API token. You don't want to use that token forever, maybe every month or every few weeks, uh, if not every day, you want to um, update that token or that password, right? That, that we call that rotation, past token secret rotation. So the AWS Sequence Manager allows you to do just that. And it's even better because for some specific use cases, like for your um, uh, RDS databases, RDS is our relational database service. If you're using MySQL or Postgre or you know, other um, databases on RDS, you can uh, integrate it natively with the Secrets Manager. So the Secrets Manager will rotate the password automatically for you uh, every few days or every day or every month. You can select the period there. Um, so this is really powerful. So all your function needs to do is fetch that secret and use it. And then the Secrets Manager will take care of updating the database password and, uh, and uh, your function will just update the new value, uh, fetch the new value uh, as long as it changes. So three different tools, two services to handle your secrets and, and parameters. And during the next more or less hour or so, it will be live coding and I'll show you some of these. Um, actually, let me show you what it looks like in code. So this is using the Python SDK, which is called Boto3. So here um, we are fetching a parameter using a get parameter function. Um, so all you need to do is creating an SSM. SSM is a, a system manager service. And once client, when you have, once you have the client, you do ssm.get parameter, you pass it the name of the parameter. Optionally, you can decrypt it uh, if it's an encrypted parameter. And all you need to do is get getting the parameter value from the response. So it's not crazy, it's not hard. If you are using it in your Lambda function, as you can see on the screen, uh, your Lambda handler can just fetch the value at either at runtime, or you can even decide to fetch the value uh, out of, of your handler so that you can cache it across multiple invocations. This kind of depends on the use case of your function. If you do it outside and you want to cache it, uh, that's great, but be aware that you know if the value changes while you're caching the value, uh, basically you might have inconsistencies, maybe the bucket or the database name or something else might change under the hood. So something that you can do is handle the change scenario in a reactive way. So you can say whenever there is this exception, uh, go and fetch the new value for me automatically. So there are different ways to do that, but just keep that in mind. If you fetch it out of your app handler, you can cache it. If you fetch it inside the handler, you are adding some additional latency to your Lambda execution. So it's a few milliseconds, I think between 20 and 50, you know, it kind of depends on the region, on the time of day, on everything. But you know, it's probably around 50 or 60 milliseconds. So if you do it like this in the inside your handler, it would be a, a bit, you know, some milliseconds more in your execution time. Uh, I've actually written a special uh, library for Python. I call it SSM cache. And uh, this library will give you, you know, a little bit of uh, syntax sugar for, uh, for your handler. So you just define a, par a parameter as an SSM parameter, you give it a name, and then you just do parameter.value. Optionally, you can specify uh, caching behaviors you know, in seconds. You can group uh, different parameters. You can use even secrets as part of your group. So it's a nice little library. It's open source on GitHub. So if you're using Python and you want to integrate it, uh, with your uh, with your function code, uh, have a look at it, uh, report any problem, or help me uh, improve it. So there was a bit of, of background about some of the best practices, some of the main challenges, some of the uh, interesting challenges that developers face when approaching serverless, uh, because we, we are a bit lazy, let's admit it. So we, we find the right shortcuts, but if you keep these practices in mind, 
it'll be much easier later on when you operate your APIs or your functions, uh, your serverless functions uh, in production. So now I want to give you this very uh, nice link, uh, amazon.to slash serverless security. Okay, this link will bring you to a GitHub repo. Let me show it to you real quick. So this is the GitHub repo, and this is a workshop that anybody can take and can go through at their own pace. Um, it's composed by a few modules. It's called Server Security Workshop. It starts from a very common uh, website architecture. So you have some clients, you have Amazon API Gateway and AWS Lambda uh, in your architecture and maybe a database. This specific workshop is using a relational database, uh, Amazon RDS using Aurora. Um, but you know, you might have other databases under the hood. Uh, it's composed by different modules. There is a module to initialize everything, like a setup uh, module. Uh, and then there are eight more modules that you can take in any order. Okay, so today I'm not really going through these modules, but I'm touching some of um, some of these concepts, some of these um, challenges, let's say. So I'm going to show you how to deal with secrets and configuration parameters, the, exactly the topic I've just introduced. And uh, we'll go through input validation, encryption, uh, usage plans and API keys uh, for throttling and monitoring your API, and even distributed tracing using uh, Amazon X-Ray. So there are a few more modules, like the first module on authorization that uh, will help you um, uh, will help you configure your web application with Amazon Cognito and uh, OAuth to scopes to handle the permissions of your different clients. Uh, there is another module on dependency vulnerability that help you, uh, you know, at build time, maybe as part of your continuous integration pipeline, it helps you uh, detect if some of your dependencies are vulnerable, so you don't want to deploy them to production. Uh, and there is even another module six on web application firewall. So it helps you configure custom rules, for example, to uh, stop requests that have a, a you know a, a payload size too big, like up to three megabytes, or you know you can configure the payload size, or even to block requests that look like SQL injection, SQL injection attacks. So these modules will give you even more, uh, but today I'll focus on the others. So if you're curious, check to do the whole experience in your own AWS account at your own pace. Uh, these modules are pretty well documented. So you just click on the module and uh, you, know, you will find very nice documentation with the steps and what we're talking about and what the final architecture will look like. Before you do all of that, you want to go through module zero. That's a setup. Uh, with the CloudFormation template, it will set up everything in your account. Uh, it will guide you through you know, filling some records in the database. And uh, you know, it's a nice little setup. So you, you are on the same page, and you have the architecture, and you can start from there to improve it. Uh, cool. So let's get started. Um, I'm not following the order. I'm not actually using the same architecture of this workshop, but I'm taking inspiration and I'm using some of the same uh, concept today. So let's get started. I'll start with secrets management and uh, configuration parameters uh, management, and then we'll go through some of the others. So let's switch to the AWS console. It's live coding time. Before we go on, is there any question for me in the chat? Let me have a look. Um, oh, there's a lot going on here. Um, I don't see any specific question for me. If you have questions during the session, just throw it in the chat and I'll try to answer. We haven't started yet, so uh, let's get started. Let's start by creating a new Lambda function. Uh, why not? So this is the Lambda console. I can just create a new Lambda function. Uh, I want to author it from scratch. I might be using a blueprint or using the serverless uh, app repo. But for today, uh, I'm just creating one uh, from scratch. Uh, cool, let's give it a name. And I'm going to choose 
uh, a runtime. So these are all the runtimes supported uh, by AWS Lambda by default. If something's not here, if your favorite language is not here, you can use even your own custom runtime. But you know, for today, I'm fine using Python 2.3 because I'm a nostalgic person. So let's use a <laughs> Python 2.7. Um, please start noticing that by default, this top, the permission stop is closed. So let's have a look in, um, at the permission tab. So by default, the UI will create a new role uh, with basic permissions. Basic permission means your function will be able to access the internet and will be able to print, will be able to log something. So it will only have CloudWatch logs permissions, basically. And uh, we are okay with that for now. We will add more permissions later on. So uh, let's create our function. Should take on a few seconds. Here we go. So does this even work? Okay, we got it. So uh, right now our function only has CloudWatch logs, as you can see here on the right. There are no triggers configured, no API, no nothing. And as you can see, the code is pretty basic. Uh, we have our Lambda hand handler and it's returning a 200 uh, HTTP response. So nothing crazy here, that's default code. Uh, yeah, sorry guys, I'm using Python 2.7 because uh, I have more experience with it, but it doesn't matter. For today, I'm just writing so simple Python code, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm just pretty sure what I'm writing works. I don't want to have uh, <laughs> live coding errors right now. Um, so let's start with from this very basic code. Uh, actually, let's add some real uh, JSON in here, like message, okay. Cool, so I'm saving and I'm testing. Uh, let's add a default, like an empty uh, input event. So this is the input that our function will receive. Let's create it and test it. So it's the default code, it works. There is nothing special here. Body message is okay, so let's go to 100. 22 milliseconds, uh, we, don't have, we don't really need a lot of memory. But you know, down here you can configure environment variables, that's what we have talked about earlier. And you can even encrypt them, and you can configure tags. Here is how, where we configure the execution role. So if I want to add specific permissions, I can open the role and modify it. Here is where I configure the power, I like to call it, call it the memory. Remember, if you give it more memory, you will also have more CPU, more networking, more everything. And uh, for today, we're totally okay with three seconds. Uh, there is some more debugging, networking, concurrency configuration, but for today, it's totally fine. So let's save it, and we're good. Now, imagine that we want to build an application that has an API, a public uh, HTTP endpoint that is um, collecting like sign up sign up data, like a user will submit a post request with some uh, sign up data like an email and uh, some more, some other parameters and we want to store that into a database, okay, very very simple scenario, okay, so we will need to uh, like fetch data, fetch sign up data from body and we'll need to write data into DynamoDB. Uh, we are going to use DynamoDB just because it's, it's a bit simpler, there's no drivers, no configuration needed, so it's pretty straightforward. And then we just want to return a 200 message OK or 201, that's up to you. Um, so how do we do that? Well, fetching the message from the body is pretty simple. You can just say body equal event body. Uh, we probably also want to do JSON loads because we want to get some JSON input, right? So that's all you need to do. We are fetching the body of the HTTP request in there. Uh, and then we'll look into how to uh, actually write into the database. But for now, let's write a simple mock so we can say something like body, body, and you know, just to test our function. Um, so if we create a new test, we'll probably get 
uh, an input like this. Our body will be some sort of JSON. And we'll figure out what, uh, what uh, the JSON looks like in a second. OK, now actually, let, let's define it right now, because we are writing a little test. We want to, we want to define it right now. So imagine that uh, we want to get an email. So let's write a simple email uh, test, test.com. And maybe we want to optionally get, uh, I don't know, a Boolean for our newsletter, because they are signing up for a newsletter. Let's just pretend we have a newsletter field, which is true. Okay, so this is our input, and I'm escaping the, uh, the, 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 the string delimiter here, but not a big deal. And uh, so this is a newsletter true input. Okay. Let's create it and test it. Oh, I actually didn't save and test it. So I am printing the body, newsletter true, email. Okay, so we can already uh, get something out of the body, like email body of email and newsletter body of newsletter. Uh, let me save and do something like this. So if the email is not in the body, something will explode. So let's do something like this. So it will be none by default. Uh, and let's also do something like this. So it's a bit more safe. But later on, we will see how to actually enforce that these parameters are in the body of our event. So for now, let's give it like let, let's leave it like this. Um, in general, if we can uh, leave our code as clean as possible and try to leave all the validation of the input at the API layer, that's what we're going to do later. Uh, you know, it will simplify your code a lot. So we'll talk about that in a few in a few seconds. Um, cool. I see some comments. Maybe. Uh, service asterisk star is bad. Mm. Okay, thank you, Dexter. I think I'll be able to show you how to actually avoid using star. I know it's a very easy starting point for a lot of use cases. Uh, I will show you right now in, uh, in like five or ten minutes how to be a bit more fine grained uh, when you start writing into a database or reading from, a, from a, an S3 bucket, for example. It's not that hard. I know it feels like there is no help. Uh, it's a bit hard to get started, but let's get there in a few minutes. Uh, okay, so our code is not doing very much, and there is nothing, uh, we haven't configured anything about APIs, so let's go and do that, first of all. So here on the left, in the designer panel, we can just click on API Gateway and configure our API. So we want to create a new one. Uh, for now, we will leave it open, uh, because I, I'm not talking too much about the authorization authentication today, but the workshop that I've shared before will tell you all about Cognito and JWT and JSON Web Tokens and all of that. Um, so the API, this name is fine. Uh, let's use a de development stage uh, and everything else is pretty okay. So let's confirm. And we should be good to say. Cool, so now I have this nice little API. Let's go and see what it looks like. Uh, it's actually configured, you know, a bit weird. I don't want to have an any, I want our uh, clients to post something. So maybe let's go and uh, edit uh, this method. I want to have a, Let's actually delete it. I know that I know it's the default, but let, let me show you how to create a new one. So we create a resource. It will be sign up resource so slash signups. So we want to post a new sign up in there. Uh, create, and then here we create a method uh, post confirm, and here we can. 
pick the lambda function, right? Uh, there are different integration types, but let's you know just select a lambda function. It's our Twitch security demo. The default timeout is fine. We want to use the lambda proxy integration that will do some magic for us. It will give us all the headers, the body, the, the path parameters. So it will simplify a lot the integration between API Gateway and Lambda. And as I mentioned before, here API Gateway is confirming, is asking us, are you sure, do you want this API to be able to invoke your function? So it's creating a function policy for API Gateway to be able to invoke our Lambda function. That's what we want, so we are good. Beautiful. So we have created this Lambda function API Gateway integration. We can already deploy it. Uh, it's in the dev environment. Let's just deploy it. And there we go. So we have this URL with the sign up, sign ups uh, endpoint. Let's try to use, uh, here I have Postman. Let's try to use Postman to verify that everything is actually working and that we are invoking the right endpoint. So new sign up. Let's just create a collection. Cool. So here I'm creating a new request. It's actually a post request. This is the URL. This is my endpoint dev signups. Um, in the body, I want to pass some raw JSON. So we want to have email, you know, similar to what we did before. And newsletter. True. Okay, exactly the same that we configured. It's a post request. We can send it. And I expect to see a very similar output. Message OK. Right? Um, so we can keep testing our function using Postman, and later on we want to test different things. But for now, we're good. Yeah, message is OK. We are invoking our function. Uh, we are actually not. Um, returning anything special. So let's update our code to verify that everything is actually all right in our tests. So let's return back uh, a, a newsletter, the same newsletter parameter. Okay. So in the response, we want to see, hey, okay, we sign you up for a newsletter or not. Let's save it. And if I invoke it now with the very same data, I expect to see newsletter false. Why? Because in the body, oh, that's funny. Let's see what's going on. We have a first interesting, oh, there was a typo. There was a space in here. <laughs> so let's fix it, save it. You see why testing is important. So test again, newsletter true, newsletter true. So we're good. We have something that works. We have a public endpoint. Um, we aren't doing anything, we aren't posting, we aren't writing into a database yet, we aren't doing anything special. So let's go and do it. We want to create a database, so let's open DynamoDB and actually create a new table for our signups. So Twitch signups, let's use email as the, as the primary partition key. Uh, should be okay. Let's actually use the on-demand capacity. So we are not provisioning how many reads and how many writes. We are just uh, going to be charged based on the amount, on the number of queries. And uh, when we're going to discuss encryption later, you know, encryption with DynamDB is enabled by default. You can choose whether to add default encryption with the master key owned by AWS, uh, or you can even provide your own uh, custom uh, master key using the key management service, KMS. Let's go with the default. We are good. Uh, let's uh, create our table. It will take a few seconds. Um, cool. Uh, so this is the name of our table, right? Uh, actually, the full ARN or table is down here. This is the full ARN, the Amazon resource name. Uh, but for now, it's okay. We can pretend that the table name is that, okay? And this is what 90% of developers will do. That's the table name I'm going to use, right? That's a good starting point. That's what most people start with. Um, 
So, do we have any, is there anything failing? <laughs> okay, I wouldn't uh, approve a pull request like that either, Hubbard, but you never know. Um, so, for, first of all, let's make sure that the name of table is depending on the environment. So, one thing we could do is reading this table name from an environment variable. So, if I do something like this, I take that and I do something like table name value and I can now go and read this table name environment variable very easily. Something like import OS and I can do OS dot environment table name. Okay, this way I just externalized the table name into an environment variable. And uh, if I save, everything should be saved. I can test it. I expect it to run. Good. Let's add some, some more print so we can make sure we are good. Uh, using table, table name. Okay, let's save again. Let's look at the tests, and we should be using the table Twitch signups again. Okay, so we're just reading the um, we're just reading the environment variable here. Nothing special. I expected it to work, but let's try to do something a bit more uh, sophisticated. Let's imagine we don't have one function, but we have twenty functions, and all of them needs to read um, this environment variable. And we don't want to change twenty environment twenty environment variables if the table changes. So let's try to externalize the value of the table name into an actual parameter. So let's do that real quick. So let's open the system manager console. Here we find a lot of stuff on the left. What we need is at the very bottom, the parameter store. So here we can create a new parameter. We can call it uh, Twitch table name. Just give it a random name. You can choose between start and standard and advanced parameter. I would say standard is totally fine. The difference is in the number of um, um, parameters per region and uh, the number of the size of each parameter and even the number of concurrent API calls that you can do to the parameter store. Uh, so for now, we are good with uh, st string. Here you can choose string or secure string. If you choose secure string, it will also be encrypted. So that is best practice, so let's do that. Um, and let's use the default uh, key ID. The value is the same to each signups. That's the name of our table. So let's confirm it. Oh, I have already the same. Uh, let's just say Twitch table. I did some tests yesterday and uh, I have the same parameter. Okay, so Twitch table is the name of our parameter. I can see the value because I have permissions to see the value. If you are just a Lambda developer that has no system manager uh, permissions, you wouldn't be able to see this value, right? So you can have different people in the organization creating and updating parameters and different people fetching and consuming those parameters. So what needs to happen now? How do I fetch that parameter? Um, pretty easy. So in my code, I can go in here and import Boto3, create an SSM client. This is my SSM client. And then maybe I create a, uh, a little function like get table name with a name parameter. So I can do a response ssm dot get parameter and since I'm really bad with remembering Boto3 parameters, I already have it here open for me. So this is the Boto3 documentation and that's what the syntax looks like. So we can get a name and the uh, optional uh, encryption decryption. So let's just use that. So we are safe. Uh, cool. So the name of the parameter is Twitch table. 
and we want to decrypt it because the, the, the parameter is a secure string parameter. So in order to be able to read it, you have to have both uh, get parameter permissions and uh, KMS permissions here. So we'll just do that in a second. Um, and then we can return response uh, parameter value. Okay, and that's our get table name. Um, and we can do something like table name equal get table name of the parameter. Actually, we want to do something better here, right? We want to use a dynamic name and we want to pass that. But wait, the name of the parameter might be dependent on the environment itself. So in prod and in dev, I might want to use different uh, parameter names. So let's do one more step. Let's do a parameter name equal OS and Byron of um, SSM param name, right? So we can actually go and read the name of the parameter from an environment variable uh, and fetch it based on the environment. Oops, right? So let's, uh, let's add a new SSM parameter name. We don't need this anymore. SSM parameter name. And I'm using uh, Twitch table because that's not the name of the table, that's the name of the parameter that contains <laughs> the name of the table. It's a bit confusing, but we might want to have different parameters for different environments. So I think this is a good trade-off between configuration and hard coding. There is not, nothing hard coded here, actually. Um, so let's save, and now if I test it, I actually expect it to fail because Lambda, this Lambda function, does not have permissions to, to do much, right? So I expect, actually I have some syntax error somewhere. Um, what did I do wrong? Uh, the parameter is there. It's the right. Let's see if it's the same. So this is real life. Oh, it's param, not parameter. So this is live coding, guys. Cool. So still an error. But now I get the actual error. So I have an access denied exception because the get parameter operation is failing. I don't have permission to do that. So let's go and fix it. Let's go um, down here in the execution role and update it. So this is the role of my function. It can do some things, cannot do some other things. Uh, what I want to do is I want to add another policy. So here I have a visual interface, a user interface to uh, choose what my function could do. I can select the, um, um, whoops, the system manager service. Uh, here I can choose which actions I want to read, so it's probably going to be here somewhere, and I need the get parameter API. Okay, how do I know it? Well, because I know a little bit about the API of the system manager uh, service. If you don't know about it, you know, you can just Google it and, uh, and find the whole list of system manager and exactly what's the name of the API or the action. So we want to use get parameter and uh, which resources? Well, we don't want to give it access to every parameter. We want to give access to a specific resource. So it's uh, UE, uh, EU West one. It's, well, this account, but now uh, I'm lazy. And this is the name of the parameter, okay? So as you can see, this is like a very nice builder for me to generate the full uh, ARN for my parameter. It builds everything for me. I didn't need really to remember all of this syntax. I just need to give it the Twitch table parameter name. So let's add, add that. Let's review the policy. Let's call it uh, SSM read table param name. And let's go and create it. Cool. So if I uh, if I go and look at the role, 
now I have this new uh, inline policy. So what the UI did for me is it built this nice JSON uh, policy, the, the JSON statement. So it was created with the visual editor. It's allowing this function to SSM get parameter for this specific resource. Okay, I think this is a good way to get started with building uh, function policies. But of course, you know, when you get familiar, it'll be much easier to just know the name of the action, know the structure of the resource, uh, and you can just build it manually as well. Uh, but you know, I think this is a good way to get started. So now it usually takes some seconds uh, because I am caching, I guess. So let's see if we can now fetch the value of the parameter. Still some error. Let's see what's in there. Uh, still telling me I'm not authorized. Let's try a few more times. It does take some time. It could be, it could be taking a minute or two. So let's give it some time. In the meantime, what we're going to do is, well, okay, our code is not too complicated yet. Um, we are getting the name of the table, but we are not writing into the table yet, right? So we created a table. Let's go and actually write into that table. Um, here I have some code for me to just put an item into DynamoDB. So this is what the uh, this is what the API looks like, but I think we are slightly out of time, so I, I don't want to bore you with the DynamoDB syntax. So let me quickly go through it and, and skip this section because I want to show you more stuff in the next uh, 40 minutes roughly. So let's pretend we are writing into DynamoDB and that it works. What happens is we will need to write that piece of code, we will need to add a new IAM uh, policy for put item DynamoDB API in that specific table. So that's what we need to do. Um, and we'll need to write an item that looks something like email and newsletter in our DynamoDB table. Uh, I don't think that's particularly relevant. Uh, we, I already showed you how to create a new inline policy and how to update your code and how to quickly test it. So uh, I want to show you some more interesting stuff. So let, let me skip that uh, step. Uh, it's not particularly interesting. So let's get into the uh, into into some of more interesting section. Uh, I wanted to touch briefly on encryption, but uh, with Dynamo it's encrypted by default. You can configure your own master keys if you want. Uh, if you look in the workshop that I shared before, there is an encryption an encryption module, and here you'll be able to actually enable encryption in your. Uh, MySQL database, okay? You can configure the database to only accept encryption connections um, and, you know, in the SQL world is a bit different. Uh, um, but basically, yeah, you, you just have to enable it in your code and uh, uh, force that every connection is uh, encrypted. With Dynamo, it, it's a bit easier, but if you want to dive deeper into RTS encryption, you can check out this module. So let me go straight to the next uh, to the next module, which is um, input validation. So what is input validation? The idea is that, um, for example, here I am reading an email and a newsletter boolean from the, the body, but uh, what if it's not there? Do we actually want to do something like if not email uh, return? Uh, status code uh, 400. Okay, this is very boring. You don't, if you have 10 parameters, you don't want to fill up your business logic with validation logic. Okay, this is something I've done hundreds of times in my life, but there is a better way to do it. So let's actually do something really brave here and go back to our previous version of our super simple Python code. So here we want to give for granted that our parameters, our body, uh, in our payload, we have the email, and it's an email, and we have a newsletter, which is a boolean. Okay, I don't want to do that in my uh, Lambda code. So let's save, and let's do it in the API gateway layer. So let me go and open the API. It's here. So how can you do that with the API gateway? There is a beautiful feature 
called models. Okay, in your model section here, you can specify a model that, and you can map that model to your API endpoints, your API resources, and API Gateway will do the model, the, the input, the payload validation for you, actually for free. You're not paying that. So your code, your Lambda function is not being executed if the payload is invalid. Okay, at scale, this is very important, not only for security to avoid, you know, code injection and very nasty stuff. It's also very powerful for, for from a cost perspective, because you don't want your functions to be executed if the payload is invalid. So at very large scale, this is very fundamental and super useful. So let's actually go and see how to do that. Uh, I'm going to create a new model. Let's call it sign up. Uh, this model applies to application JSON content type. I don't really want to describe it, but so let's give it a two title sign up. It's a type of object and here I can specify all the different properties. Okay, what kind of syntax are we using here? Well, it's just JSON schema. So let me find JSON schema uh, string. So I go here and that's what I can do. So actually in the string JSON schema field, there is a special validator for email spec kind of strings. So I don't even have to write the email validation, right? So how do we do that? Let me show it to you. So I'm going to define a email property of type string. And then I can say something like format equal email. Oops. Is that email? Uh, yeah, so there are some built-in formats. So if we have a date or an email address or a host name, an IP address, you know, these are all JSON schema predefined types that you can just use yourself. So here I've defined an email property of type string for my email. But I can actually say that the email field is required. So if there is no email in the payload, I don't want the request to proceed. It's a required field. So let's do the same for the uh, newsletter field. We have another field called newsletter. It's not of type string though, it's a boolean. Do you think we have a JSON schema boolean? Let's look for it. Google is helping, yes. So we have a boolean type. All we need to do is, is it boolean or boolean? I'm not sure. Sorry guys, I'm not a native English speaker. I'm from Italy. Um, but yes, so we can just do type boolean or boolean. And I also want the newsletter field to be required. So JSON schema required. Is that how you say required? Uh, yeah, required and then just the list. Cool, I'm just double checking because my memory is really bad again. Um, so this is my schema, this is my sign up module. Um, two required properties, one string formatting, uh, formatted as an email and one newsletter field, which is a Boolean. So I create that model and now it appears here in my models list. What I can do now is I can go into my signups post uh, method in the method request integration and here I can do something like request validator, validate body. So I can validate the body, the query string, the headers. So here I'm just expected to post some JSON body. So validate body is totally fine. I can confirm that. And then request body, I add a new model here, application JSON sign up model. And that's it. So let, let me actually go and test it already. I can test my post request here in the API Gateway console. If I give it an empty body, 
you know, I expect it to fail, I'm actually given an invalid request body response. So that's what I want. If I give it a, I don't know, an email, uh, like a number, I expect it to fail because it's supposed to be an email. If I give it a nice email and a nice boolean like true, I expect it to go through. Cool. Of course, if instead of a boolean I give it a string, I expect it to fail. So I have implemented input validation in the API gateway layer. And remember, this is not only pretty cool, this will help you in, with two things. First, your code will be much simpler. Okay, in my Lambda function code here, I can kind of give for granted that I will have an email and a newsletter body payload. I don't have to check for it. I don't have to be super safe. I don't have to mess up. And I don't have to add if statements. And the second advantage is that um, you do not have uh, to invoke your functions just to validate the input. If you are at scale and you have millions of requests every day, uh, you want to exclude from your costs, from your budget, all those requests that are invalid. An API gateway will do that for you. So I think this is pretty cool. Um, and we can do exactly the same. If we redeploy our application, our, our API, so I can just redeploy it in the dev environment, in the dev stage. And now I can just test it exactly uh, the same way from my Postman. So if I give it the right input, it's fine. If I use the wrong type or if I don't give, whoo, it's passing. This is fascinating. Funny. What's happening? So let me double check. Is it the right API? Is it the right endpoint? Yes, yes. Sorry, let me double check. I mean, it worked. This happens. We are live coding, so it's invalid. Uh, let me try with a, an empty body here. Oh, you know what? I'm not passing the right header. So I'm supposed to pass um, a, a, a content type header. If I pass a content type, JSON uh, application, JSON, uh, you know, it will actually be, the request will be mapped to a, um, to a, um, to my model. So what I was doing wrong is that I wasn't passing, right? I wasn't passing any content type header. Uh, and you know, so something you might want to do is, is also using some kind of default model for like unknown content types. So here I'm passing a body, a JSON body, but without a, the right header. And, and, and you know, it wasn't going through. You probably don't want that. So in a more advanced scenario, you also want to apply the same model to other content types, right? It could be XML, it could be uh, like uh, any other content type your API might be using. Uh, cool, so that's something. Um, let me tell you about another thing, uh, another module, another topic that is usage plans uh, or API keys or, you know, there are use cases where uh, you might have different API consumers or, or different API clients and have different requirements or different um, uh, capabilities or different uh, rate limits, you know, things like that. Imagine you have different type of customers that pay a different subscription based on how many API calls they can uh, they can um, they can request per per minute, per second, per hour, uh, or that you want to actually track and do different throttling mechanisms, uh, monitoring mechanisms for different types of customers. So we call those usage plans. So let me show you what it looks like on API Gateway. You can go down here and create new, a new use, usage plan. So let's create it. Let's call it basic. And let's imagine we have a basic API consumer and uh, I don't know, an advanced or premium API consumer. So we can set up different throttling mechanisms. So how many requests per second 
you want your basic uh, API consumer uh, to be able to do. Let's say one. Uh, one is fine here. And how many requests per month you want them to be able to do? I don't know, let's say 100. Okay, so this is a very basic, maybe like a free to your uh, API uh, throttling configuration. So you configure your, uh, your, um, uh, your user's plan and then you can create API key and stages. So let's, uh, let's pick our API, let's map the stage environment and we're good. Okay, now that we have configured the usage plan and mapped it to the API stage, we can actually go and create uh, API keys to, to, you know, we can give API keys to our different clients and API consumers. So uh, we can create it. We just give it a name. It could be like Alex. This is the API key I am personally going to use. And, and you can either auto-generate it or provide a custom one. And this is the custom one is particularly useful, for example, if you're using Cognito to authenticate your API. Because you, you, know, you, can, uh, you, you can map an API key and a user plan to a specific Cognito user or Cognito client ID, for example. So for now, let's auto-generate it. Um, and I'm done. So and now I have this API key, API key in here, uh, and it's mapped to my uh, API stage. But my API is still open. You see, if I go and, 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 uh, and okay, now it's invalid. But if I go and invoke it with the right payload, my API is still reachable. So what I want to do is um, update my API to request, to, 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 to always request an API key in the, in the, in the headers. So there is a, a parameter here that you can configure and I'm going to set it to true. So my API, this specific API resource is going to require an API key in the request. Otherwise, it's not going to accept any request. So this is a bit of authorization and, um, uh, um, you know, it's a bit of authorization and use user's plans. So you can use different throttling and monitoring mechanisms for different clients. Let's redeploy it. And now if I try to invoke it, I should get a really bad error, I suppose. I'm not, yeah. Right, so I'm getting an error. The deployment is done. I'm getting a forbidden error. So what needs to happen is that I need to pass another header, which is X API key in here. And let me find the value of my API. I can find it here, show the API key, copy it. I use it in my X API key header and it should now work. Okay, so now it works. I'm using an API key. I have a one request per second uh, uh, throttling limit and I have a 100 API request per month uh, limitation. Uh, because I'm using that API key. So let me actually show you that if I start running a lot of requests, uh, I'm going to get throttled. So let's use the runner functionality of Postman. So if I run this uh, new sign up request and I do it you know, 10 times with zero millisecond latency between each request, I expect uh, some requests to be throttled. So let's see what happened. Yes, you see? So the request is so fast that uh, I'm getting 200 for a little while, but at some point I'm getting a 429, which is a status code for too many requests. Okay, so I'm getting throttled. And I, if I keep doing it, uh, I will actually, uh, uh, meet the 100 requests uh, per, uh, per month. So now I'm getting 429 in more or less all the time, right? I already reached 100, so more or less for another month, if you want, we can try again in uh, 31 days. 
I'm not going to be able to invoke the API uh, for another month because I saturated my 100 calls. Okay, cool. So let's go to one more topic. Do we have any question in the meantime? You're using get, not post. Am I? I think I'm using post on Postman. Maybe it was related to my uh, API gateway, but anyway, I'm doing a post right now. Do invalid requests have a cost on the gateway? Um, if I remember correctly, no. Okay, those requests are not being charged on API Gateway and on Lambda. Uh, if somebody in the chat, like Hator or some other service friends want to confirm that, checking out the pricing page, I'm 90% sure that those requests are not being charged. Uh, I'm 100% sure they're not charged on Lambda because Lambda is not being executed. Uh, I need to double check on the API Gateway side, but I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, do we have any other question real quick? So what's the API backend language? Uh, yeah, as, as, the, as a Pandar responder, it doesn't really matter in this case. I could right now go here and change the runtime to Java or Node.js or Ruby or Go, rewrite my function in uh, probably 30 seconds because it's pretty simple. And everything else, the input validation, the usage plans, plans and API keys, everything else I've shown you would be exactly the same. Okay, so it's not really uh, a big deal. Um, so let me go and show you uh, another module, another concept. So we have seen the secrets, we have seen input validation, we have talked about encryption real quick. Uh, I told you about usage plans and API keys and throttling um, with API Gateway. I now want to tell you a bit about X-Ray and distributed tracing and monitoring. So what happens is that you may have different services, uh, different Lambda functions with different triggers, like maybe some S3 bucket is triggering your Lambda, some API gateway endpoint is triggering another Lambda, and all these functions are reading from a database or writing into here. You know, the architecture might get pretty sophisticated, pretty complex, even to track in your mind. So having a visual way to look at your architecture and to see what's going on and which API calls are failing in a production system is pretty neat. It would be beautiful, right? And it's actually pretty challenging in general, depending on the architecture. So there is a service called Amazon X-Ray or AWS X-Ray that does exactly that for you. Um, so let me show you what it looks like. Uh, first of all, what we need to do is we need to enable X-Ray on Lambda and enable X-Ray on API Gateway. And then we want to also track what our function is doing. We are invoking uh, the parameter store or we are writing into a DynamoDB table. So we want to track also those API calls and to look at our architecture overall. So let's go and do that. First of all, in the Lambda console, I can uh, simply enable active, uh, active tracing here. And this is pretty cool because um, I would need X-ray put trace segments permission and X-ray put time to records permission. And the AWS web console is doing that for you automatically. So this is pretty neat. But if you're doing it in your CloudFormation template, remember that you need those permissions for uh, putting traces into X-ray. So let's just enable it real quick. And let me do the same on the API Gateway side. So here on the stages, in my dev stage, uh, there is a logs and tracing tab where uh, I can uh, enable X-ray tracing. So now X-ray is able to trace your API invocations uh, to your, uh, map them to your Lambda function. So we can see API Gateway in our visual um, distributed tracing uh, service. So let's also say that, let's also redeploy it. I believe you, you will need to redeploy it. So let's do it real quick. Now, if I just leave it like that, 
I'm going to see API Gateway and Lambda. But again, I want to see more. I want to see what my function is doing, what other services it's actually invoking. So I need to do something more. Uh, I need to enable, I, I need to add something to my code. It's nothing really crazy, but it, you know, it's a couple of lines of code to be able that, to make sure that whenever we are using the SDK or if you're doing HTTP calls to third-party services, could be like, I don't know, the Twitter API or the Twitch API, you want to track also those calls. So in your visual uh, X-ray diagram, you can see everything. So in order to do that, we need to add the X-ray SDK to our uh, function code. So I can't just deploy stuff, add stuff to this repo here, to this uh, deployment package here. So let me actually go and use uh, Amazon AWS Cloud9 uh, to modify my function, install the uh, X-ray SDK and redeploy everything. Um, so here, this is the AWS Cloud9 environment. Um, uh, it's basically an IDE in the cloud. It's already co connected to the cloud. You have IAM permissions to fetch resources and to do anything you want. So I, I can see here in the AWS resources tab, some remote functions. These are all my Lambda functions in the current region. And I want to take the Twitch security demo function and import it into the Cloud9 environment. So I'm importing it. And what this will do is it will fetch everything from that Lambda function. Uh, so I have the template, the CloudFormation template that allows me to deploy this function everywhere I want. And I, I have the, the actual code in here. This is the same code we were modifying in the Lambda console. So what I need to do is I need to add a few lines of code here. Uh, I'm really bad with memory again, so I'll copy and paste it. So I need to import the, the, the patch all uh, function from the X-ray SDK core. And what I do, I just run it. Okay, this patch all will basically patch Boto3, it will patch uh, you know, the HTTP client, it will patch everything it finds in the environment. Um, if you want to patch specific modules, you can just say, hey, just patch, uh, for example, uh, Boto core, okay? Everything we are doing here is using Boto to fetch an SSM uh, parameter. Um, so I could just patch Boto core and I'll be okay. But you know, if, if I were using other uh, third-party API or whatever, I would want to patch all and it does everything for me. I don't even need to configure it. But this library, AWS X-Ray SDK, is not included in the Lambda environment, in the Lambda image, in the Lambda uh, runtime. So I need to install it, then bundle everything with my code. So let me do it really uh, quick and dirty. So let me use the console, the terminal down here. So I'm going to CD into this project, Twitch security demo, where I have my files. And I'm going to install the X-Ray SDK in this folder, okay? There are a thousand better ways to do it, but I have only a few minutes. Uh, you could do this in a Docker container, you could uh, automate your, your, um, your uh, packaging using AWS SAM, CLI, you know, now I'm just doing it really quickly for you to kind of understand what X-Ray looks like. So I'm just installing a couple of libraries. And again, this will be installed in the current folder. So it's a lot of stuff that we need. We are installing only two libraries, but it needs a lot of stuff. It doesn't matter. Uh, what I can do now is just right click here and deploy, okay? Cloud9 will take the whole folder, uh, bundle it into a deployment package, a zip file, and deploy it to Lambda. Okay, let's do that. Again, there are different ways to do it. You can use the serverless framework, you can use AWS SAM CLI, uh, you can build your own tooling if you have a lot of free time. Uh, I think Cloud9 is really uh, intuitive, uh, and you can just right-click deploy. 
Um, so now that we have a lot of dependencies and a lot of files in our deployment package, I cannot open the code in my Lambda editor anymore. It's telling me the deployment package is too large to enable inline code editing. But it's fine, I can keep using my Cloud9 environment and update my code and right-click deploy it. That's a simple way to do it. In a real world, you probably want to have a continuous integration pipeline that when you git push into your repo, uh, everything uh, gets deployed to a development or a production environment uh, automatically. But you know, it's not today's topic, so let's not focus too much time. Let's not waste time on it uh, for now. Um, so I've updated my code. Let's see if it actually, if it still works. Because we are live, things might break. Internal server error. So let's go and find out uh, what happened. So I can check my monitoring tab and I can open the logs in CloudWatch so we can see exactly what's happening. Uh, oh, there is some modules missing here. Interesting. So I'm probably installing the wrong dependencies. Let me do that again. Uh, so we need AWS X-Ray SDK and setup tools. Uh, do we also need Anum? I think this kind of depends on the environment you're running in. Uh, yeah, Anum is not a package. Uh, let me see what's missing. Uh, yeah, no module name Anum. So I think it might depend on the version of pip that I'm using that's kind of giving for granted that some packages are already in the system while some are not. So let me debug that live because I don't really know how to solve this. So let's find a good uh, solution to that. Okay, let's see if that will solve it for us. Sorry about the live issues. So let's do pip install this here. Let's see if that's enough. <laughs> let's redeploy it. Oh, do you think I'm using pip for Python 3? Oh, you're right. You are right. So I'm actually using the wrong pip. So it's assuming some libraries are there while some libraries are not there. So that's a good point. Let's see if it works anyway. It works anyway. Okay, so in Python 3, the Anum 34 library is there by default. It's not in Python 3, Python 2, obviously. So I, I install it. For some weird magic, it works anyway. So I'm using pip for Python 3 and the Python 2 runtime. So this thing happened. Uh, I could just update the runtime here to Python 3 and probably we would have fixed it uh, anyway, but you know, we are live, I'm doing it a bit quick and dirty. So let me show you the, let's do some more invocation first. So let's give it another, I don't know, false parameter just for fun. Cool. And let's open the X-Ray console. So here now X-Ray is computing a visual map of what's happening in the system. So there are some clients invoking our API gateway. And as you can see, this is live, some invocations fail. That's why we have this red uh, part of the circle. And API gateway is, working, is invoking Lambda, and Lambda is invoking the actual Lambda function. So this is a Lambda service is invoking the actual Lambda function. So let's click in here. Let's filter only the request that worked. Uh, and let's view the traces. So if we have one trace in here. Let's see what it looks like. So we have uh, some cold start happening. Uh, let me actually find another trace. It's not super clear. Let me do some more invocation. Let me update the map. And let me find another trace. 
that actually worked. So we have a few traces here. This is the most recent one, I think. Um, so if you remember our code, let's look at the code. We are uh, we are invo we are fetching from SSM only the first time that our function is invoked. So if we change this and we do something like that and we start fetching the table name at every single invocation, just to show you some tra interesting traces here. Okay, this is not recommended, but if I'm fetching the system manager parameter at every single Lambda invocation, I want to show you what uh, AWS API calls uh, look like. So let's quickly update it. Let's do some more API calls. Got it. Some more. Let's change it to true. And let's do a few more. Cool. Let's go back. Let's look at the service map again. Let's update it. So in the last five minutes, all green. So this is a good. Uh, this is good. This is nice. Um, and now you also see AWS SSM because our function is invoking SSM. If we were also writing into DynamoDB as we should have been doing, you would also see that our function would be invoking uh, DynamoDB. So let's look at one, some of these traces here. Let's view them. Let's. Uh, Pick one, this is two minutes old, so probably not what we want. Okay, it's still not there. So the nice thing of distributed tracing is that it distributed, it takes a while to actually get into your charts. The idea is that you look at this data every few minutes, every few hours, you don't really spend your whole day in real time watching at the traces, but this is a bit more interesting, I think. So this is real, okay? This is an invocation where there was some uh, call start in here. Probably not. I don't think it was a call start. Uh, but this is the lambda total execution in here. Um, this is the function execution. So there is some you know before and after uh, overhead. But you can also see that most of the execution, which is this one here, the dark blue one, is actually spent fetching the SSM parameter. So this is roughly 50 milliseconds out of those 51 are being used to fetch the parameter. That's why you want to fetch the parameter only once out of your Lambda handler. Otherwise, you're adding 50 plus minus 10 milliseconds to every single invocation. But I think it's pretty cool that you can see where the, where the time of your invocation is being spent. If we were writing uh, writing into Dynamo and reading from S3 and doing all sort of things, you would see a lot of lines here telling you exactly uh, which API call to which service was being invoked. So here we're doing SSM get parameter. You will see DynamoDB put item or S3 uh, get object, for example. And uh, here we're doing nothing after retrieving the parameter, so we're spending roughly 0 0.4 milliseconds uh, returning this uh, JSON response in here. So it's not super interesting, but you can see what's going on in your code. Um, so question, is the func if the function calls another external API, can we see it too? Yes. So since we are doing um, uh, X-ray SDK core fetch all, this would also patch your um, um, your HTTP client. So if you are calling the Twitter API or if you're calling the Twilio API or some other third party API, you would see those API calls in this visual map as well. So you, here you will see another line, another arrow uh, pointing to the endpoint that your function is invoking. So that's pretty cool. Um, Cool. Any other question? Lambda free tier. So Lambda free tier is very useful. So if you are a startup, if you have a side project, uh, there is the LLS free tier that allows you to invoke Lambda 
you have roughly 1 million invocations of 100 millisecond every month for free, forever, right? So as you can see, there are some services that are free for 12 months and some services that are free forever up to a given quota. And as you can see here, it is Lambda gives you 1 million free requests per month, uh, depending on the duration. If it's 200 millisecond, it will be half a million invocations. So it depends on the duration of each invocation. But you can do a lot. I've seen startups surviving <laughs> on the AWS free tier, uh, maybe for a year or two, until you actually reach those one or two million invocations per month. And when you do that, it will be maybe a couple of dollars. So it's not that your cost will uh, be 20 times more. You just get out of the free tier, you start paying a few dollars or pennies, depending on storage, compute, and so on. Cool, so I think we don't have too much time left. We uh, finished our 90 minutes. I want to remind you that uh, most of the material that we have seen is actually based on a, a public workshop that you can find on uh, GitHub. It's here, amazon.to slash security. So check it out, it's on GitHub. You can do all the steps I've shown you, but using a relational database, using a MySQL Aurora database, and uh, you will see a lot more steps about authorization with Cognito and O2 scopes and um, encryption in transit between Lambda and, um, and your RDS database. You will see a lot about dependency vulnerability scans, maybe as part of your CI CD process. So today we have only scratched the surface, uh, the surface uh, and it was like a little bit of basics and best practices around um, configuration management, about uh, input validation. Don't, don't forget about API gateway models. You can do input validation for free uh, without hitting your Lambda functions. And you can also at the same time simplify your business logic code. So don't forget that it's a pretty good feature of API gateway. Um, I hope you enjoyed the live stream. Uh, and the live coding and thank you very much for joining. I'm Alex Hazelboni. You can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. If you have more questions that I could not take live, please uh, just uh, text me on Twitter, text me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to help you. Thank you everybody for joining.